So I'm wondering when you look at that iron test, the iron panel, how, how do you approach that? Yeah. So at least in my institution, if you order an iron deficiency anemia panel, it will come with a CBC with diff, um, a serum iron level. And so serum iron is just like the circulating iron in your system, um, a TIBC, um, and then the transfer and saturation, which is a calculation based on those two numbers. Um, and of those three, I don't really care about any of them except the TIBC, um, especially serum iron. If it's not fasting, you know, we have a lot of referrals that come to us that were diagnosed with iron deficiency. They get started on iron. They probably don't take their iron. Then like the day before they get their labs checked or the day of their lab checks right before and they take their iron. And then their pediatrician's like, oh my gosh, they have hemochromatosis. Their iron level is 200. Stop the iron and refer to hematology. And um, it's not, it's just, you know, reflective of the fact that it's very that much what is currently in your system. So that I think is, is less helpful. Ferritin is kind of the best marker of your storage iron, but obviously is difficult to interpret in some patients if they have underlying inflammation. And the cutoff for that is incredibly controversial. So I think this is actually one of the biggest points that people really need to realize is that um, most labs, when they do these reference ranges, it's not actually supposed to tell you like, this is what your ferritin should be. It's just, they took 120 people that they decided were healthy and then cut off the bottom two and a half percent and the top two and a half percent and said, this is your ferritin. And so a lot of labs have very different ferritin reference ranges for males versus females. And we know that iron deficiency is incredibly common in menstruating people. And so within the population, even of healthy, quote unquote, people, there's a lot of iron deficiency. So like at our lab, the lower limit of normal ferritin for like um, premenopausal women is seven. Even though we have a lot of studies that show that your bone marrow is not making red cells appropriately anywhere near that number. And so, you know, some people will say cut off is good cut off is like 25 when you're talking about adults. Most hematologists think probably higher than that. There's data that shows that at levels less than 50, your body like upregulates dietary absorption of iron. Um, but levels of like 30, you can start to see differences in other hematologic indices. But I think it's really important to remember that iron isn't just to make red cells, right? It has all of these other functions in the body, right? It helps make neurotransmitters that are associated with mood disorders. It is involved in all of these different biochemical reactions in our body. And so just looking at hematologic indices or anemia when we're talking about iron deficiency doesn't make any sense. You have this iron studies in front of you. You said you don't look at anything except for the TIBC and maybe the ferritin if they're not in an inflammatory condition. And then like, then what are your next steps? Yeah. So like I said, the iron level and the transparent saturation, I don't really place much weight, much weight on. Uh, the TIBC can be helpful in differentiating between iron deficiency and anemia chronic disease because it should be elevated in iron deficiency and, and decreased or normal in um, anemia chronic disease. I have the benefit of being in an academic center and so I can order like additional tests. And so if I'm unclear about whether it's iron deficiency versus anemia chronic disease, I typically will send a soluble transferrin receptor um, which is elevated in iron deficiency and is not really susceptible to the same issues as ferritin in terms of being an acute phase reactant. Um, and so that can be helpful. It does take a little bit longer to come back. Do you find yourself at all using an abnormal CRP, the cutoff of like five, as a sign of there is inflammation as this, I guess, general gestalt to maybe provide context to the iron panel? I don't do that super frequently. But that's what you read about all the time is like get a CRP with your ferritin. I think I'm just spoiled and will typically just send this liable transferrin receptor. I think with kids, like they're constantly exposed to different things. And I think if you have like a little virus that increases your CRP, that's probably not like what's going on with your anemia. So I don't typically use it a lot that way, but I think there probably are people that do. I feel like a lot of people use TSAT to like differentiate, okay, if the transfer and saturation is less than 18 or like 12, depending on the cutoff percent. Um, it's iron deficiency, but it's greater than 12 to eight, like eight, if it's greater than 18%, then it's anemia of chronic disease. Why, is there a reason why you don't look at, look at the TSAT? Your serum iron level will be decreased in iron deficiency, but also be decreased in anemia of chronic disease. But that calculation also has TIBC in it. So I just feel like I don't believe you're from on here 
So why not like stick with the TIBC? Have you ever had a case so difficult that you've actually brought it to bone marrow biopsy to diagnose iron deficiency? I've always heard that's the gold standard, but I've never even read a study where it, it came to that. I wouldn't say that we did the bone marrow for that reason. There's probably been like two or three patients where they had a lot of other things going on um, and we weren't exactly sure. And so they were getting a bone marrow like for a different cell line and that we had them do like iron staining. But I, I've never done the bone marrow just for that reason. It always felt a little bit drastic. I know, right? 